All right, um, let's get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Neil Rakesh. I'm one of the attendings in the anesthesia pain service. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you all to the 10th annual Subhash Jain Honorary Endowed Lecture Series at Memorial Sloan Kettering. For a little context, Dr. Jane was actually the founding chief of the Department of Anesthesia's pain service, and he served as the director of the pain fellowship during his tenure. Now, I know everyone really loves Zooms. Uh, you do so many of them. So we decided to make it a little more fun, and we turned it into a fireside chat. Uh, in the first part, we're going to have a, a set of topics that we're going to go through. Uh, and then in the second part, we're going to open up the questions to you all, and uh, you can you can ask some questions that uh, that are on your mind. If you have any questions during the during the actual thing, you can place them in the Q and A section, and we'll look at them there. Um, but you can also raise your hand if you want me to kind of open your video and anything else. Uh, but during the actual thing, please turn your video off. Make sure you're muted, uh, just to make sure that you don't pop up on the screen. So we have a very special guest today. He is the current Surgeon General of the United States under President Biden and served as the prior Surgeon General under President Obama. Without further ado, Dr. Vivek Morthy. Hi, Neil. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to be here with everyone today. It's a real honor. Absolutely. Uh, let's dive right into it. I know there's a lot that you're that you're probably is on your plate and a lot of things that you're doing. What are the top issues that you're dealing with in this current administration? Well, Neil, as, as you probably imagine, there's no shortage of public health issues that are facing our country. That are facing our country. But one of the things that um, you know we have to do in, in our job is to try to figure out what our, our priorities are. And so uh, amidst the, the number of really important issues that, that we're facing, we've zeroed in on, on a few, and I'll tell you about what those are. When I started my, my tenure in 2021, early 21, we were in the middle, as many of you remember, the you know, a really profound pandemic. And, uh, you know, we, we were about a year into it, <clears throat> but it was still quite taxing. We were dealing with, we hadn't yet even come upon the Omicron variant, which really changed the game uh, for many hospital systems around the country. So much of my focus in those early months was on, uh, on COVID. But one of the things that <clears throat> was also clear to me, even before taking out the job, is I was watching what all of you were watching, which is the tremendous stress and toll that this pandemic was taking on healthcare workers, on people across our country, teachers, parents who were struggling to figure out how to manage school for their kids, uh, you know, in a virtual environment. <clears throat> and the mental health toll uh, of the pandemic was becoming increasingly key, uh, clear. And so one of the decisions I made is that the mental health and well-being more broadly would be areas of focus uh, for me, uh, not only because the pandemic had made them worse, including for specific populations uh, like frontline healthcare workers, uh, but that it had built on a general downtrend in our mental health that had been building for years, where we had been seeing rising rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide among young people even before the pandemic. Uh, so that has been where my my, my core priorities have been. And you know, we've issued uh, over the last two and a half years, uh, sort of key Surgeon General's advisories on youth mental health, on health misinformation, uh, which I know many of you have to deal with on the front lines every day. Uh, we've also issued advisories on health worker burnout and well-being, laying out a strategy, strategy and agenda for what we need to do as a country to better support uh, healthcare workers on the front lines. And most recently, uh, we issued two uh, new advisories, one on the subject of loneliness and isolation, which have become epidemics, unfortunately, in our country and have profound impacts on mental and physical health. And then in May, uh, our last advisory was on social media and youth mental health, uh, reflecting the most common question that I've been getting from parents, which is about <laughs> yeah. social media and its impact on their kids' well-being. Uh, so those are the areas that we're focused on right now. Going forward, uh, we'll continue to, to go deeper on many, many of these issues. And we're looking at additional topics as well uh, that are related to mental health and well-being. It's a broad bucket, but it's a really important topic because one thing that I've realized uh, both for my two stints as Surgeon General talking to people in different parts of the country is that when your mental health is compromised, it's really hard to be your best self at work, at school, in your community, with your families. It's really the fuel that allows us to show up in our lives and to be our best selves. And that's what we've got to work on replenishing, especially for our children. 
Yeah, I mean that's a that's a hefty amount of things that you're that you're going through, uh, and I know obviously we see a lot of this in the day and age, and I'm, I'm sure you've noticed this coupled with um, COVID, where people were confined to their homes, social media being one of those things as you just addressed, and then that kind of uh, maybe exacerbating it even more um, with loneliness in terms of in terms of it becoming a crisis. So it makes sense why you uh, why you deem this as one of your main main missions in terms of what you're dealing with. Do you find, since we're, we're a hospital that deals a lot with cancer patients, do you find that loneliness is something that cancer patients will uh, experience as they're going through their treatment journey? I do. You know, I, I, for me, you know, even though I've had uh, you know, have the it's a wonderful privilege to serve in, in government, I, I still, my, my primary identity is still that of a, of a clinician. And I lean back on many of the experiences I had over the years, taking care of patients to inform the work that I do now. Uh, and that includes... Uh, you know, the experience of, of loneliness that so many patients had when I was uh, working as a hospitalist, and those included uh, patients who were, who were dealing with cancer. I think cancer has some unique elements to it, um, just because of how culturally, uh, the, even the diagnosis of cancer has, how it affects people and how that, thankfully, it's evolved, I think, in a more positive direction, whereas 20 years ago, when you somebody told somebody that you had cancer, then they assumed there was no hope for for you, and thanks to the extraordinary work of scientists and clinicians, that's no longer necessarily the case uh, for many types of cancer. And so there is hope. There is there are pathways forward, uh, but I feel like that for still a bit of that cultural um, sort of uh, overlay, if you will, uh, that cancer being um, perhaps a, a heavier diagnosis than other medical conditions we deal with, still hangs over many of our patients. And I do think that that, that can contribute, uh, in, in a sense, to a greater degree of loneliness. Because when you feel you're dealing with something that is an existential threat uh, to your life, uh, you can go in one of two directions there. You can either go toward people and embrace them and ask you to help, ask them to help you, uh, or you can retreat further into your shell. Uh, and many people do retreat further into their shell. And I don't blame them for it, necessarily. We uh, there are many, many complicated reasons why people may retreat further and become more isolated at a time where they actually need other people. Uh, it's many, many of you may have experienced this as well. At difficult moments in your life, you might find yourself pulling away from people, uh, even though we could probably benefit from their support. I have done that uh, as well. And some of that has to do with, with shame uh, as well. Uh, sometimes there's shame associated with getting sick. And it's not necessarily a rational thing, but I think... We've all experienced shame at different points in our life, and we know that it doesn't always have to make sense. Uh, but that shame can sometimes put up barriers around us and push people away. So I do think that uh, given that, again, the unique over cultural elements related to cancer, but also just given that cancer is also a, it's usually a, a longer term illness that people have to deal with, not something, yeah. it's not like an infection, you get an antibiotic, you clear it, uh, and you're fine a couple of weeks later. Uh, for that reason, I think that the stress on individuals can be protracted. Um, and again, the stress is something that can either take you toward people if you reach out for help, or it can force you further and further into your own shell. Um, so <clears throat> I, I do think it's a unique, uh, it's a phenomenon, loneliness, that people who care for cancer patients, I think, should be aware of. Um, and here, too, you know, I, I just want to, to, to give you know, sort of kudos and 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 recognition to uh, the Jane family here. Um, you know, Dr. Jane uh, Subashian uh, has been obviously a <clears throat> it's an important figure uh, in the Sloan Kettering community uh, for the work and the program that he started 22 years ago for pain management, uh, and that's very much connected, by the way, to the issues we're talking about here because the, the experience of pain, especially untreated pain, uh, is one of the things that can dramatically impact someone's mental health and well-being. Um, we know that pain is very interesting, but when we, we perceive mental uh, sort of, I would say, emotional pain and physical pain uh, in very similar ways in our brain. Uh, and <clears throat> when people have pain, that physical pain that's not treated adequately, you know, it can start to impact their mental health over time. Uh, and we can also have seen, as, as I'm sure almost every clinician on the call has seen, that uh, that emotional pain can also sometimes over time feel like physical pain to a patient or accentuate the physical pain that they have. So there's an important interplay here. And I think that the, the focus on treating pain well, recognizing it as an important phenomenon to address and prioritize, um, that's something that I feel like we've only more recently 
uh, started doing it, uh, you know, to the degree it's needed as a medical profession. Uh, and I know that Dr. Jane, in building the pain service 22 years ago, brought that recognition of pain as a critical uh, issue for us to focus on for the overall health and well-being uh, of patients. And so I just, I really applaud his visionary leadership in that regard. Um, and I also just want to say a quick word about his son, Dr. Sachin Jane, because uh, so some of you may know, uh, Dr. Subhash Jane's son, Sachin, is uh, an incredible leader in the healthcare community. And one of the things he did of the many uh, that have really impressed me is when he was leading Care More Health, uh, he built a program to address loneliness among seniors, to recognizing long before many other health systems did, uh, that loneliness is actually very important for the health outcomes that we're all driving toward in the healthcare system, whether that's reduced hospitalizations, whether that's reduced incidence of illness to begin with, whether that's better adherence to medications and to follow-up appointments. Uh, and so the program that he built at Caremore really was a pioneering effort uh, to address loneliness as a priority in our healthcare system. Uh, so the Jane family has contributed a great deal uh, to healthcare, and so it's a true honor to be here uh, for the Subash Jane lecture. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, that was that was a great answer to that question. Um, I, I know you 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 tied a lot of these things together, um, and you said uh, even emotional pain can can manifest as physical pain. Do you find that that the loneliness and maybe the lack of connection uh, does that affect an overall like treatment outcomes? Does does your mind and where you're at? mean that you're going to do good or do bad um, when you're going through kind of this rigorous this rigorous treatment regimen for our cancer patients? Well, I do think that, you know, our mental state does impact our physical health. And I, I think that connection between our mental and physical health has become more and more clear over the years, whether it's, uh, you know, I remember when I was in training, uh, learning about studies that were just coming out, showing the link between uh, depression and outcome post MI outcomes uh, for patients. Um, and we started to see that, uh, again, in the case of depression, that that was linked to worsening health outcomes for other illnesses as well uh, over time. Um, and th this really, uh, you know, I, 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 think, I think about my own parents, honestly, who, are, who started a medical clinic, a primary care clinic in Miami when I was a small child. And by all the time I used to spend with them, and I didn't understand a whole lot about the science at the time, of what was happening in the clinic. But I would see patients coming in looking stressed and worried and then leaving, uh, knowing that they had a partner in their healing and looking a little more comforted and less anxious. And what my parents actually would tell me as a kid is they would say, you know, you've got to take care of the worries that your parents, your patients have uh, in order to also take care of the physical illness. And it took me years to realize that there was actually science behind what they were saying. Um, and they understood it intuitively. Um, but I also think, look, many clinicians uh, on this call, I suspect, know this intuitively as well, uh, that <clears throat> when a patient is struggling with their mental health and well-being, um, that it's harder for them uh, to take care of their physical health. I, I saw it all the time as a clinician. We would discharge people with, you know, it's, I'm sure it's familiar to many of you, with long lists of medications and long lists of follow-up <laughs> appointments. And it was clear when people were really struggling with their mental health, it made it harder for them to just just to, to follow through on a lot of those follow-up appointments because if, if you're feeling like you're struggling with severe depression sometimes the last thing on your mind is making sure that you've taken 14 out of the 14 medications in your discharge summary right so there's a real interplay here between physical health and mental health but even beyond the logistics of adhering to recommendations and care uh, i do think that with mental health and with the stress that people see we've increasingly now seen that stress itself is physical manifestations and that chronic stress uh, in particular can have negative physical manifestations. Here, I think it's worth making an important distinction between acute and chronic stress. Um, we know from our, our own work and life experience that acute stress, short-term stress, uh, can actually sometimes help elevate our performance. And this has you know, evolutionary roots, right? So when we were hunter-gatherers, um, if all of a sudden a predator appeared in front of us, um, we had an acute stress response in our body uh, where our heart rate would increase, our blood pressure uh, would increase, the flow of blood to our muscles uh, would increase, and we would be prepared to fight or to flee, right? That's a classic fight or flight response. In that acute state, 
stress enhances your performance, right? And you may have felt that before giving a talk, before taking an exam, before uh, maybe one of your children's big exams or before college acceptance letters arrive at your doorstep. I mean, these are all moments of stress. But chronic stress is different. Chronic stress actually is associated with chronic inflammation, which as we all know, can damage tissue and blood vessels and increase the incidence of uh, illness, including cardiovascular illness over time. And this is actually thought to be one of the mechanisms through which loneliness actually causes health outcomes over time, is that it actually puts our body in a chronic stress state. Um, and this is in part because, again, to go back to that example thousands of years ago when we were hunter-gatherers, um, we learned over time that there was safety in numbers, uh, that when we actually pooled our food supply uh, and when we took turns watching for predators, uh, you know, for the group, that our overall sense of safety and well-being was enhanced. We were, it was, we were less likely to starve because we were sharing our food, less likely to get attacked by a predator because we happened to fall asleep at night. Um, with the, 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 by contrast, when we were separated from our tribe, that's when our risk of survival dropped, right? And so in that state, you know, we, 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 our body was in a physiologic stress state. And even though our circumstances are radically different today, we're not living on the tundra, we're not worried about saber-toothed tigers, but our nervous system <laughs> is actually very much the same as it was thousands of years ago. And so we respond to loneliness with a very similar stress response uh, as we did back then. And if that motivates us to pick up the phone and call a friend or to get in the car and go see a family member, that could be helpful. It might relieve loneliness, just like hunger or thirst if responded to uh, you know, can be healthy responses to a natural signal. It's when we don't respond to it, when loneliness is either severe in magnitude or protraction in duration, that the chronic or extreme stress can start to have debilitating effects on our health. And we we see that in the numbers, uh, uh, Neil. We, we in the Surgeon General's advisory on loneliness and isolation that we issued uh, in in at the end of April this year. We noted that the increase, the rate of, or the, the risk of depression, anxiety, and suicide all go up significantly in people who are struggling with loneliness. But the rate, the the incidence of physical illness goes up as well. Twenty nine percent increase in the rate uh, in the risk of cardiovascular disease. Fifty percent increase in the risk of dementia among older patients. Significant increase also uh, in the rate of <clears throat> of premature death. In fact, at rates, uh, the risk of premature mortality with loneliness and isolation uh, is comparable and in some studies even greater than what you see with the risk of premature mortality with obesity. And think yeah. about how much attention we, we pay to uh, issues like obesity. So all of this just to say that the link between our mental health and our physical health is deep and it's profound. And it's why if we only approach the care of patients with a focus on physical illness and we ignore what's happening with their mental health, it's like trying to fight uh, disease. It's like trying to fight for their health with one hand tied behind our back. And, uh, and to truly take care of the whole patient, we have to take care of both sides of the house, the mental and the physical. That's definitely well said. And I, I'm sure if there were saber-toothed tigers roaming around New York City, I would definitely be in a chronic stressful state. Um, <laughs> I know this is probably not the answer. And uh, people in my generation turn towards social media as, as kind of a proxy for, for trying to be connected, but it, it may not be the, the, maybe the best possible way. Have you found effective ways to mitigate loneliness, to foster social connection? What have you found that has helped a lot of people overcome some of these issues? It's really a good question because it's worth just saying a word, Neil, about how we got here to being as lonely as we are and as yeah. isolated as we are. Um, and by the way, this is not uncommon. I know we don't talk about issues like loneliness and isolation uh, among colleagues necessarily or with our patients all that often. But to give you a sense of just how common this is, about one in two adults today are reporting measurable levels of loneliness. The numbers among kids, among young adults, are actually much higher. Depending on the study you look at, they can be anywhere from 70 to 80% uh, of adolescents who are reporting uh, that they're experiencing loneliness. So th this is incredibly common. And we talked you know, just a, a few minutes ago about how consequential it is for mental and physical health. But the way that we got here was, it didn't happen overnight. This has been building for years. In the last half century or so, we've seen a decline in participation in many of the community organizations that used to bring people together. So think about recreational leagues, uh, service organizations, faith organizations. Participation in all of them has declined over the last half century. Yeah. 
the other thing that's happened is, uh, you know, we move around a lot more, right? We might move somewhere for school or for jobs. We may not stay in a job for a long time, but we move from job to job. We even move from city to city. And, th and that's great. There's nothing wrong with that per se. I mean, we may be pursuing great opportunities, but one of the consequences that we haven't really mitigated for, uh, one of the adverse effects, if you will, is the loss of community that happens every time we move and leave people behind. Now, we all know that when you're close to people geographically, when you can see people in person more, it actually makes a real difference. And COVID, I think, helped many people recognize that, that you know, being uh, you know on Zoom is really convenient. We can do things, the conversations like this. This is really wonderful. Um, but it's also important to be together from time to time to see people in person. It, it makes a real difference. Uh, so that's a sort of second factor. The third factor is that we have the convenience of technology, right, which allows us to get boxes delivered to our house when we want to buy a product. I can get groceries delivered to my house. I don't really need to set foot in a grocery store or retail store <laughs> ever again if I don't want to. And that actually has efficiency uh, gains in some ways. But we have to also be mindful of something that we've lost, which is uh, human interaction, right? And during COVID, so many people told me a really interesting, interesting thing. They said, you know, I expected to miss my mom and dad. I expected to miss my kids or my close friends who I couldn't see in person. But you know what I didn't expect? I didn't expect to miss seeing people at the coffee shop that I used to work at. I didn't expect to miss running into people in the grocery store. I didn't expect to miss just seeing neighbors. Uh, that those like unexpected interactions with uh, loose ties, you know, people, you know, with who I mean we're not necessarily close to, but we enjoy seeing, or even with strangers. That's actually a part of the uh, sort of human connection, the glue that holds us together. And we we have less of that uh, because of tech. But the last piece is the social media piece, which you mentioned, um, which I actually think has profoundly changed how we interact with each other. You know, at the end of the day, it's not that technology is good or bad, right? Technology is a tool. It can help us. It can hurt us. Uh, and I say that as somebody who is a big user of technology myself, uh, I spent seven years building a technology company before I was you know, serving in government. I'm a believer in technology, but yeah. it's how it's designed and used that ultimately impacts, whether it helps to us or hurts us. And one of the reasons actually that we issued a, a recent report on social media and youth mental health was because when you look at the data all together, like uh, the, the, the data that's currently available, what you really see are two things. One is there actually isn't enough data for us to say that, hey, social media is safe. It's not harmful for you. It's fine you know, to use. Instead, what we have is growing evidence that is pointing toward harms. So if we see, for example, that kids, that adolescents who are using more than three hours of social media a day are at least double the risk of anxiety and depression symptoms. And you know what the average amount of use is per day now among adolescents? It's three and a half hours a day. Right, so the majority of kids are, are well over uh, that risk threshold, uh, but other things we see as well. You know, for all the the benefits of social media and that it can help people find community at times, it can help uh, bring people together and be a bridge to offline interaction. Uh, it can help people share and express themselves. But yet, ha and half of adolescents are are telling us that using social media makes them feel worse about their body image as they constantly are comparing themselves to other people online. And so I think we have to be mindful here that when new technologies come on the scene, um, we've got to actually try to understand how they're helpful, how they're they're harmful. And you know, our report was focused on youth, but I'll say, look, as a as an adult myself, I will you know admit I have struggled over the years with how to use technology and social media in ways that are positive and not negative. I've had that experience of being about to go to bed and saying, hey, let me check one thing on my social media feed for two minutes. And then somehow 30 minutes later, I'm still there, you know, and I've also had the experience of um, of just scrolling through uh, various updates and then <laughs> sort of feeling like I'm comparing myself, you know, to like all the things that I'm seeing online, even though I know it's not rational, even though I know people are posting their best about their best days and their best moments. And it's not fair to compare that to my average days, but we all do this. Right. And so part of I think what we have to do in this in this new world, if we want to reconnect with one another um, or I can I give you some, a few simple steps, you know, that I, I try to keep in my own head. Uh, one is, I think it's important to just keep a few minutes each day where we're reaching out to someone by phone or in person, hearing their voice, seeing them. That's really powerful. It's really important. It can be just five minutes a day, just to call and check in someone and see how they're doing. But that time matters. The second thing we can do is we can make sure during that time that we're fully present 
uh, with the other person. If you're like me, you've been guilty of reaching into your pocket when you're on the phone, when you're talking to a, a friend and somehow scrolling through your inbox, checking the scores on ESPN. And sometimes you're like, why am I doing this? I don't even know why I don't need to do this. Like I somehow I'm just doing it. Uh, but that's the devices are built to sort of like keep lure us in and keep us in. So uh, this is uh, they're tailored, you know, to maximize how much time we spend on them. But they also can detract from our the quality of our conversation. And I know like many of us have probably taught ourselves over the years or told ourselves, hey, we can multitask. We're good. We can do three things at once. We're still paying attention to what's being said. But the science is actually super clear that we actually don't multitask as human beings. What we do is we rapidly task switch in our brain. Right. So, yeah, you might remember the words like if you and I are talking, Neil, and I'm yeah. like multitasking on my phone, I might remember the words that you're saying. I might be able to repeat them back to you, but I've like lost some of the nuance, <laughs> some of the, the detail. And the other thing is you can tell like when other people aren't paying attention to you. Right. Because we've all had yeah. that experience of being in conversation with somebody who's not fully there and it doesn't really feel good. Uh, so that's the second thing we can do is for those few minutes that we are talking to someone or in person or on the phone, be fully present, allow yourself not, don't allow yourself to be distracted by other things. You might feel twitchy initially, but I guarantee you the conversation will feel better for both of you. And then the third thing that I would, I would encourage people to do um, is to create tech free zones actually in their life where they can put aside uh, their devices and, and just be, you know, whether it's with other people or with themselves, that might be for a half hour before bedtime or throughout the night. Uh, it might be at meal times uh, when you're with others. Uh, it might be when you're, you know, at the gym or when you're uh, taking a walk. But having time where you can just focus on other people yourself is really important to, to rebuild connection. Uh, so the, the last thing I'll just mention to you that you can do, and this is a counterintuitive thing, but finding ways to serve and help other people turns out to be one of the most powerful antidotes to loneliness. Uh, and this is important, not just for us, but also as we think about how to talk to patients about loneliness. The reason I say this is counterintuitive is you might think, hey, if I'm struggling with loneliness, don't I need somebody to help me? Why am I going out and helping somebody else? But here's why it actually is very helpful. Because when we help someone else, whether that's with you know, helping somebody pick up papers that they just dropped on the floor or helping someone clean up coffee that they just spilled or helping them by listening to them because they've just been through a really difficult experience. What we're doing is we're, we're helping form a connection with somebody uh, that feels really good in the moment. We're helping them feel seen and heard uh, simply by showing up uh, and listening. But we're also reminding ourselves that we have the capacity to connect and that we have something of value to give to someone else. And that is so important, Neil, because when we become lonely over time, what happens is our we start to chip away at our self-esteem, at our sense of self. We start to feel like, you know, I'm probably lonely because I'm not likable, because something is wrong with me, because I'm broken in some way, because uh, I'm just not good enough. And I say this not because it's theoretical. I say this because I've experienced this myself as someone who struggled with loneliness as a child and felt like, it was probably because I wasn't good enough. And also as somebody who struggled with loneliness at many times as an adult and felt a lot of shame uh, and guilt about it. So service, helping other people, even in those small moments, it's one of the most powerful antidotes to loneliness that we have. I love it. Those are very simple and easy tips for people to, to be able to really kind of combat this. Um, I know I'm guilty of the, the, you know, the endless scrolling and they call it an Instagram hole or a YouTube hole. But it is interesting to hear your perspective that every single technological advance has a positive effect and a negative effect. So like you said, like Amazon packages make your life more efficient. I, at the same time, it does take away some of that social connection. So I think as you're pointing out, if you understand the pros and the cons of each technological advantage, you can use it to your advantage, but set yourself and have these kind of like technological boundaries. And I really like that, that insight into, into kind of picking apart that, that thing, because I don't think technology, as you said, is bad as a general thing. Um, just to kind of, uh, kind of tack on, bring it to like the kind of the healthcare realm of things and what we deal with. I know there's a lot of burdens that people talk about the healthcare system. Do you, what do you find healthcare workers, the healthcare system, even insurers are doing as a means to address the social connection and isolation that people may develop as a result of going through the healthcare process? Yeah, it's really, it's really important. And I, I do think, look, the loneliness is a societal problem. And one of the things I laid out in our advisory is you know, in terms of the national strategy is that there are roles for, for government, for the private, you know, for 
private the private sector for technology companies etc that they all need to take upon uh, themselves now in order to address loneliness the healthcare sector is one of those uh, places so i mentioned this because i don't think the entire uh, responsibility for solving loneliness falls on the shoulders of doctors and nurses and healthcare systems, but I do think they have an important role. And here's what I think uh, that, that they can do. So let's just think about individual clinicians, about healthcare systems, and about payers, about insurers. When it comes to healthcare systems, uh, to start with, one of the things we know is really important is just to start tracking the number of people who may be dealing with loneliness and isolation. Uh, you know, we can't tackle what we can't see. And so tracking the data, asking people uh, about the loneliness and isolation is an important place uh, to start. And then we can target our efforts uh, accordingly. Um, healthcare systems can also though, uh, help to set up the supports for clinicians uh, to take action when it comes to addressing uh, you know, uh, loneliness and isolation. What does that mean? It doesn't, in my, mean, this shouldn't, in my mind, this shouldn't mean that we add one more huge responsibility to the list of primary care doctors who are already uh, dealing with plates that are over overflowing. Everybody's adding things to primary care yeah. doctors to do. Um, but if the system is able to gather uh, data on loneliness and isolation in terms of intakes and present that uh, to clinicians, that gives them a data, a piece of data that they can use and factor into their thinking about a patient. It may uh, lead them to want to open up a conversation with a patient about loneliness and isolation. And in here, the reason this is important in terms of clinicians opening up this conversation is you don't have to solve a patient's issues with loneliness and isolation, and you certainly don't need to do it on the first visit. But one of the things we can do is, clin and, and I say that because as clinicians, our goal is to solve problems, right? Uh, yeah. One of the most the frustrating moments for me as a clinician would be seeing a patient who had a problem that I didn't have a fix for, uh, whether it was a procedure, whether it was a medication or, or, or lifestyle change. And, um, and so I know from a, that doesn't always feel good, but this is a place where the conversation is part of the intervention, right? Where so many people who have been struggling with loneliness by themselves is feeling shame about it, not talking to anyone about it, but simply opening it up and helping a patient understand, hey, you know, it's, it's, if you're struggling with loneliness, you're not the only one. This is a really common problem. It doesn't mean that something's wrong with you. Um, a lot of society is moving in this way. And, and we got to think about how we address this together, how we how we show up for one another, like that in and of itself can help the patient to feel, okay, this isn't all my fault. The burden isn't on my shoulder. So that is a, a place I think clinicians can make a big difference. Yeah. Um, but one other thing I'll mention that I think health systems can do is to help build partnerships with community organizations uh, that can actually help to address loneliness. And this is something that the UK has started doing through their social prescribing program, uh, yeah. which is a uh, they've, you know, they've found they they realized that the job of a hospital it can't always be to to solve the entire social connection issue. But if there are community organizations that are bringing people together for activities to engage with one another, uh, if there are groups in the community that are supporting people with substance use disorders like AAA or others, um, if a community, if a health system can pair and partner up with them, such that they can refer patients who are struggling with loneliness to the appropriate partner. That itself can be, uh, you know, an important uh, service. Finally, I'd just say about insurers, since you asked about them. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think from a rational perspective, I think it makes sense that payers would want to ultimately work upstream, invest upstream, uh, and reduce uh, not just the disease and burden, but healthcare costs, you know, for themselves in the long term. For that reason, I think it makes sense uh, morally and financially for payers to invest in addressing loneliness. And what does that mean? That means uh, that means reimbursing for time that's spent by clinicians and by health systems in assessing loneliness and intervening on loneliness uh, among patients. It means also providing patients directly with information to better understand loneliness and isolation. So they again understand this isn't necessarily their fault, but so they also have connections to community resources that can help uh, mitigate loneliness and can help bring patients together. I think it also means those supporting innovative models of healthcare delivery, including group visits. You know, I think the move toward doing group visits with patients, I think is really in interesting and powerful. And for all of those who may not be familiar with group visits, it doesn't mean that you force patients to always be with other people and they have no <laughs> privacy to talk about their healthcare. That's not what group visits are. People yeah. can still do individual visits, but from time to time, you may have 
patients with diabetes, for example, all come together uh, in groups of maybe five or 10 people to meet with a clinician and to share best practices with each other. Uh, you may have patients who are struggling uh, with breast cancer, for example, uh, come together and meet with a clinician as a group, but then also have a chance to support one another and hear about each other's experiences. These are incredibly powerful uh, for patients. And that's where we, in the, from a therapeutic perspective, harness not just the knowledge of medicine and the power of traditional therapeutics, but we also harness the therapeutic potential of relationships between patients and the connections that can help support, provide support for them in ways that sometimes clinicians on their own can't. So these are just things that I think the health system can do. We can reduce stigma, we can improve access to uh, community organizations that provide care, we can gather data, and we can support <laughs> clinicians in having these kind of conversations, which I think are more and more essential. Yeah, I I like that. That's uh, it's the group the group aspect of it is actually very interesting, and I think it's a pretty innovative approach because I, I like where you kind of said you're not alone. A lot of people are experiencing this, and being able to see someone else through the process or um, kind of struggling with the same things makes you feel that there is hope or there is something that you can go through it together because. Uh, I mean, there's the old adage of you can go so far by yourself, but with multiple people, you can go kind of very much farther. Uh, and so I, I do like that um, to some degree. Uh, let's uh, let's let's open it up to uh, the rest of the the rest of the audience. Uh, we kind of went through a lot of the the general topics I, I think we wanted to cover in the beginning. Uh, if you guys have any questions, feel free to uh, unmute yourself. You can turn your video on um, and you can ask your questions. Um, or you can type your questions into the chat or the Q&A, which I'm looking at as well. Don't be shy. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much for a very, very informative talk. Um, identifying the social ailment of loneliness. Um, I'm not a physician, uh, but I'm quite active in our community. We have observed three things in the last 10 years, and every year it becomes worse. Hmm. Pe people's desire or ability or inclination to volunteer in community services or community organizations has declined. In our temple in Mawa, uh, we used to have 70, 80, 90 volunteers, and now we struggle with 10 to 15. Lots of people uh, feel that they cannot come because their children are so busy, they cannot drop them to the community center. When we approach the Bergen County, um, uh, hundreds and millions of dollars of taxes that are spent, not a single penny is spent on providing transportation. Even the connectivity is not there. So those people who are inclined to come do not come. So th th this, this is largely the people who are 55, 60 plus, uh, who have retired or semi-retired. We find it equally disturbing that the younger people have basically disappeared uh, from the scene in terms of getting the understanding, the values and the beauty and the joy that one gets from doing service. And their struggles are very different. Their argument is that we are so busy, we don't have childcare support, we have only Saturday and Sunday our children are over-programmed, running from one place to the other because the competition that has been created in the, in the society and the need for materialism that has been accentuated is preventing us from, uh, from uh, doing anything because we don't have time to breathe. So rather than going to the third one, I just wanted to mention that as a social science data that we have been collecting. And the community organizations are for dying because of that very process that I just identified. Your thoughts. Well, Mr. Gosla, you make very good points. And I think you're getting at the heart of something that 
is deeply concerning, uh, which is that, yes, we have seen less participation in service organizations and faith organizations and communities. And I think, and part of that, I think, is you mentioned transportation as one obstacle and time as the other big obstacle. You know, I, I worry deeply about what's happening to kids in the current environment where they're being pushed to do more and more activities, fill more and more of their resumes so they can get into a fancy school or get a fancy job. And it's almost like we have taken all the free time, like in their days, and have structured it. They're over over scheduled and they're over structured. And you know, I don't blame parents per se because parents are, are they're trying to do right by their children. They're being in a sense, getting messages from society that if you don't do all these things for your kids, if they're not in all of these classes, doing all of these uh, other extracurriculars and building their resume, then they're not going to get into a good college. They're going to be not going to be successful in the future. But when I talk to young people, actually, what's interesting to me is that many of them are not happy with this situation either. Uh, the way they just, they describe it with the term they call hustle culture. Uh, it's the term they use again and again. And they say, we're caught up in this hustle culture. We're being told to chase all this stuff, and is it really going to make us happier? Is it really going to bring meaning to our lives? I actually think that that's the right question to ask, uh, because it, the truth is that um, I'm not sure that the pers I, that the um, pursuit of a lot of these things is necessarily going to add to our kids' happiness. Um, you know, I was meeting with a group of chaplains, university chaplains, uh, just a few few weeks ago, and. It, it, these are chaplains who have been taking care of college kids for somewhere around the last 20 to 25 years. Uh, they've seen generational shifts in what's happening to kids. And they said to me a couple of things that were concerning. They said that, interestingly, in 2008, when the Great Recession happened, they were looking at millennials who were entering college at that time. And they said that even though the economy was in such a bad place, even though job prospects were so dim for so many and unemployment was so high, there was still this sense of hope and optimism among the students saying, gosh, stuff is really bad now, but uh, I think it's going to get better. I think we can figure it out. Um, and hopefully that time will come soon. Fast forward just a few years. And they say now when they look at Gen Z students who are entering college, they see that optimism is gone, even though you, by many standards, the economy is much better than where it was during the Great Recession in 2008. They say this is bigger than the economy. This is bigger than like a, you know, a, a number or a specific technical measure that you may uh, look at. There's something deeper happening uh, that's leading uh, young people today to feel more dissatisfied, less hopeful, and also less comfortable reaching out to other people for help. This is a really important feature they mentioned, that the comfort reaching out to others, the comfort expressing ideas that others may disagree with, that all has dropped precipitously. And I think that that's really concerning because when I think about my own children, my kids are five and seven, uh, Tejas and Shanti. And <clears throat> when when I think about them and the world that they're growing up in, like, look, I don't know what profession they're gonna follow. I don't know what school they're gonna go to. I don't know what subject they're gonna like. But one thing I do know is that I want them to be fulfilled I want them to be happy, and I want them to be contributing members of society. I want them to be a part of making other people's lives better, too. Um, they can do that through a variety of means, but how do they learn how to do that? Well, it turns out that kids learn a lot of that by, number one, seeing their parents model it, by, number two, having opportunities to engage in service, and, number three, by having opportunities for unstructured playtime with other kids. That last part is really important, but it's an unstructured playtime that kids discover things. They negotiate things with other children. They learn how to manage conflict, how to express themselves. But when things are overly structured, overly prescribed, kids don't learn that. They actually become more hesitant uh, to communicate. They, they, they become um, more hesitant to deal with conflict. And so I, I do think that these are, this is part of a broader co a concern I have, Mr. Costa, with what's happening with with our children today, but I couldn't agree with you more that creating opportunities for our children to engage in service and to do so with each other uh, is extraordinarily important. It will take a cultural shift in what we're pushing our kids toward. Uh, it'll take a shift away from the kind of hustle culture that kids describe, but that can only happen, I think, if parents 
decide together that that's a shift they want to make. Uh, this is a this is sort of a collective action problem. If you're the only parent out there who's saying, you know what, I'm going to step away from this current system where, you know, X, Y, and Z are valued, and where I have to overschedule my kid, and I'm the only one who's doing it, that's hard. But if a group of ten parents come together and say, you know what, we're all kind of feeling the same thing, we're going to make this decision. We're going to take a bit of a different path with our children. That can become more manageable. It's the same with managing social media and your kids. You know, I think. For any child to do the things we're talking about, participate in service, have unstructured playtime with with other kids, that's time that's off of your devices, that's off of social media, right? But if you're the only child who's not on social media and everyone else is all the time, that can feel lonely and isolating. But if parents come together and say, "Hey, look, we're all struggling with this social media thing. What what if we decided that we're all not going to let our kids use their devices uh, for the hour before bedtime and throughout the night?" What if we all decide that we're going to actually take away devices during dinner time? What if we all decide that when our kids get together to play, we're going to have them put their phones in a basket and just actually focus on each other and play with each other? Those are things that can make a real difference, I think, in the well-being and the resilience of our children. But it's going to take that kind of collective action. That's great. Uh, just to, I feel like we're running the first uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering radio show. Uh, just to kind of streamline this, because we're getting questions from multiple places. If you have questions, uh, actually put your questions in the Q and A section. Uh, and even if we don't get to it, I can give it to um, uh, Dr. Morthy's uh, staff, and they can go through everything. And if we can provide answers at the end to it, anything we don't get. Um, one of the next questions is actually um, a little bit different. Uh, we're going to change gears, uh, and it has to do with opiates. It's something that we deal with very regularly um, with cancer patients. And um, I know there's been recent changes in a lot of the things. Have you seen that the restrictions of opiate prescriptions have changed how people are prescribing opiates? Have you seen that there has been an overall improvement or change in the opiate epidemic? Well, th thank you for that question. And I was just reading that uh, question in the Q&A box here. Um, look, I, I think that there have been a lot of changes on the opiate front in the last 10 years. We've seen prescriptions of opioids drop significantly in, in the last 10 years, somewhere in the range of around 40% or so. Um, and you know, I think part of that is I think uh, clinicians, our colleagues are are more judicious and thoughtful about prescribing. Um, you know, we all want to make sure that people who need opiates can actually get them. Now, that's important too. Uh, and I think there, there, you know, I know that there are there have been some challenges where some people have felt that uh, it's been harder to get the medications than they needed. Um, I think a few. Well, this differs a lot depending on the health system you're in, the insurance carrier you're dealing with. But one of the things I think that that concerns me greatly is that. We have put up too many barriers, I think, to care being delivered that, prescri that prescribers and patients both feel is appropriate. Uh, and a lot of these barriers come up in the form of prior authorizations. Uh, prior authorizations, when you do surveys of clinicians, uh, stand as one of the most vexing barriers uh, that they face. This is actually something that we uh, called out and, and focused on in our advisory on health worker burnout. Uh, was the fact that these prior authorizations, which you know many of us on this call have had to deal with, myself included, uh, I've had to deal with it as a doctor, I've had to deal with it as a patient. Um, I had a medication that my son needed uh, when he was uh, actually acutely ill, uh, and it was a Friday, and I remember going to the pharmacy to get it, and they wouldn't fill it because they said a prior authorization was required. It was for an antibiotic. Uh, no, no, it was for an inhaler. Um, oh wow! They said a, a prior authorization was uh, was required, and it was a Friday, and they said they couldn't process anything till Monday. Uh, and it's those kind of situations where, whether you're dealing with that as a patient or or, or as a as a clinician, you know it doesn't make sense. Uh, and many of us have probably been on the phone arguing with people in the at insurance companies trying to get the rehab bed, the medication, um, the follow up visit that we know our patient needs, but that won't get approved. So reducing those kind of barriers to, to getting care and to prescribing are really vital. And we've actually been working with CMS on the issue of prior authorizations. CMS has now taken steps to reduce prior authorizations. And uh, we are all now trying to figure out how to work with the private sector, with private payers, to push them to do the same. Um, look, the bottom line is that at the end of the day, if you need care, uh, you should be able to get it and you should be able to get the kind of care that you and your clinician feel uh, is critical you know for your your health and well-being and so that's where i think knocking down some of those barriers like prior authorizations is so important 
I'll lastly say this, with all that said, with when it comes to opioids, you know, we have to be, I think, thoughtful and judicious about how we prescribe. I think, I think we can largely, as a medical profession, recognize that the pendulum did swing, you know, to, to one extreme, uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Uh, I remember when I was in training being taught that uh, opioids are not addictive if they're given to someone who has real pain. Uh, we now know that that is not the case, right? Um, but I think that we likely prescribe them more liberally overall as a profession. I'm not saying everybody on this call, but, you know, as a profession, we prescribe them perhaps too liberally without enough um, uh, sort of, uh, I would say, awareness of some of the, the downside impacts and the addictive potential. Um, so we've got to be mindful of that. We have to, but I think we also have to, to knock down the barriers to appropriate care, which I think too often exists in the form of prior authorizations. That's a that's an interesting thing that that obviously you've dealt with, and I'm sure every physician has dealt with. Um, it's difficult as you're navigating those things, and this is a question from the chat as well. How do you sustain your own stamina as you're really trying to you're doing things, you're advocating for your patient, you're saying, "Hey, I believe the patient needs this treatment," and as you're trying to go down that journey of effect, meaningful change, how do you maintain that 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 stamina and prevent the loneliness that you may experience by having to do some of these things for other people? Hey, it's a, it's a thoughtful question. I appreciate it. Um, right. You know, I think that for, well, I'll tell you, I have some experience here because I did it the wrong way once, right? I have had the <laughs> privilege of, of serving as Surgeon General now in two stints. And the first time I will say, I don't think I did a very good job uh, in managing how I balanced uh, my own sort of mental and emotional needs um, with the job. One of the critical mistakes I made, uh, in fact, is that, you know, I told myself, okay, you know, this is a, um, this is an, a once in a lifetime opportunity. I have a chance to do something to serve the public. Let me put all my time and energy into this. But I, the critical mistake was I did so at the expense of my relationships. So I started, I, I was not calling friends back. When they called, I wasn't proactively reaching out to friends. <laughs> Even when I was with family members, I was distracted a lot. You know, I was at the table, I was on my email, like thinking, you know, okay, the important issue may come up. I got to deal with it here. There's a, I need to be tracking the news all the time for health stories that are coming up because I may need to respond to them. We can tell ourselves all these stories about why it is that we need to deprioritize things like our relationships, our sleep, our, our physical activity, the things that can help keep us mentally healthy. Um, but at the end of the day, that came at a great expense to me, you know, and when I, when my first term as a surgeon general ended, uh, and it ended quite abruptly, I was in a circumstance where I realized I didn't have my work community and I had largely neglected my community outside of work and I was profoundly alone and I felt quite burned out. So when, when President Biden asked me to come and serve a, a second term, which I was not expecting to be back in government uh, so, so quickly, but pandemic was happening and a lot of us a lot of our lives went in different directions than we anticipated. Uh, but when he asked me to come back and serve, I remember talking to my wife, Alice, and saying, I, you know, I think, I think, you know, he's going to ask us uh, to come back to government. Uh, what do you think? And she just looked at me and she said, Vivek, what's going to be different this time? And I knew what she meant. She wasn't asking like, you know, how are your hours different? You know, what topics are you going to be working on? <clears throat> she was asking like how our emotional lives were going to be different. How are we going to manage? Uh, that that challenge. And so, you know, I, I won't say I'm, <clears throat> I'm certainly far from perfect, but I do think one, one of the things that I've tried to get better at between that stint and this stint uh, is to protect the time I have uh, with people uh, in my life. And that means uh, going to do drop off with my kids, you know, for school whenever I can, uh, making pancakes for them in the morning, which I uh, got up early to do. And um, my regret, because I think they might expect pancakes more often on weekdays, now, <laughs> uh, which I'm worried about. <clears throat> um, but more seriously, it involves also just with friends, trying to make time <clears throat> proactively with friends uh, when they call. So, for example, when a friend calls, uh, before I would just, you know, silence it when I was tied up with something or working on something, and I would just figure I'll call him back later. Now I'll just pick up the phone, even if it's just to say, hey, it's so good to hear from you, Neil. I, I can't talk right now because I'm about to step into this meeting, but uh, can I call you back later today or can I try you this weekend? And even that 10, 15 seconds of hearing your voice, Neil, will make me feel better, you know, and, and, and vice versa versus, you know, delaying and just adding to my to-do list, call back Neil at some point, you know? Yeah. Um, so 
I, I'm trying to be better about <clears throat> also just being present when I'm with family and friends and not bringing phones to the dinner table, focusing on my kids. Uh, kids, you know, as many of you who are parents know, they can kind of keep you honest at times. I found myself checking my email once when I was supposed to be playing with my kids and they were, you know, lo looking at something and I happened to look at my phone and my kids turned around and they looked at me and they're like, why are you doing that? And I felt like so guilty. I was like, oh gosh, like, I don't need <laughs> to be doing this. Um, but anyway, it's in the small things. It's in the the quality of the time that we spend, the small moments where we pick up the phone when someone calls. It's um, the extra moment we may take to just check in on a friend on the way to work, even if we just have five minutes. I have found that it's in those moments that I can maintain and sustain connection to others and that I can ultimately feel better and less lonely, like in the work that I do. So thanks for the question. Yeah. Um, we're, uh, we're getting towards the end of this. Um, and I know there's, there's still a lot of questions. So for everyone, I'm going to, I'm going to pose, I'm going to pose the questions, uh, to Dr. Morthy's team, uh, and we can send out, uh, answers to them, uh, at, at a later time. But, uh, just to kind of finish things off, are there any other thoughts, Dr. Morthy, that, that you have, uh, that you think you didn't touch on or anything interesting, um, that you can offer as a little bit, a uh, tidbit of wisdom that you've, that you've experienced? Yeah, well, First of all, it means so much to me to, to be able to to be here with with all of you virtually, and um, to be here, you know, for a lecture that's um, you know in Dr. Subhash Jain's name. You know, somebody whose work uh, I deeply admire and whose family uh, has meant a lot to me uh, over the years, personally as friends. Um, but more broadly, it means a lot to me to be with fellow clinicians. You know, people who care so deeply about health who are on the front lines helping to deliver care and relieve suffering uh, in some, some often extraordinarily difficult circumstances. You know, I mentioned earlier that I still feel my primary identity is that uh, of a doctor, even though I've been blessed to have a chance to wear some different hats. Um, and part of the reason for that is because there's a core set of values uh, that our colleagues have pulled together around, values that brought them to do this work, values that center around wanting to extend kindness and compassion to others, uh, working hard to relieve the suffering that others may be enduring, working to make other people's lives better, even if it's just a little bit. And those are the values I think we need more of in society today. Uh, sometimes I you know, talk to people around our country when I travel and people say to me, you know, it somehow feels like we're becoming meaner, like our dialogue is becoming more coarse as a country, like it's somehow become more important to be right than to be kind, to be powerful, than to be just. And I do understand why people say that, because when you read the news, when you're looking at dialogue online, um, it feels like that at times. And in moments like this, more than any other, I think what's needed uh, is a moral reawakening in our country, where we come back to the core values that really do matter, that we want to build our lives around, that we want to build society around, uh, the values of kindness and compassion, of generosity and service, of friendship and love. These are the values that make us strong. These are the values that each of you on the front lines uh, deliver each day uh, as you care for patients. And that's why I think that the country and the world need clinicians now more than ever before, not just for the work they do day to day in caring for patients, but for the values that they demonstrate and I would like to see more of a light shined on that because I think the world needs to know that things are not as dark, you know, as it may seem if you just watch the news headlines uh, and read posts on social media. The real magic of humanity, that core spirit of kindness and generosity, that is still alive and well inside of us. And all of you serve as living examples of that. And I want you to know that because I think it's important for society to know uh, wow. the value that clinicians are yeah. providing in this moment. But it's also really important for us to remember that the work we do is even bigger than the patients we're caring for, but that we're helping set a larger example, I think, for the country of how to live in a way that's consistent with those deeper human values. So I want to do everything I can during my time as Surgeon General to shine a light on what our colleagues are doing across the country on the front lines and on the about shine a light on the values that they're living by and demonstrating. Um, but I just want to thank all of you for being inspirations to me, uh, you know, over, over time. I think back about our colleagues all the time, like in medicine, whenever I'm feeling 
uh, down or, or feeling starting to get cynical. You know, I remember those nights working shoulder to shoulder uh, with f fellow residents, with uh, medical students, with attendings, with nurses, where we all put aside differences that we may have had in our opinions and our personalities and our politics. And we came together to serve. We came together to relieve suffering. We came together to help. That's the spirit that we need more of in this country. And that's why I think our clinicians uh, are such a shining beacon uh, for our country when we look to create better days ahead. So thank you for everything you do. Thank you for having me uh, here today. And and thank you to your families as well, who do, do, do a lot to support the extraordinary clinical work uh, that you do each and every day. It was really wonderful to be with you. Yeah, this has been an amazing conversation. I, I know I know, I really appreciate it. I'm sure everyone else really appreciates your candidness of speaking about your own experiences. Um, it sounds like you're going to be even better uh, on the third time around. Uh, so <laughs> uh, I look forward to all the things that you're going to be doing um, uh, as we go forward. And uh, for everyone else, thank you so much for spending the time today and and logging on. Uh, we'll have uh, we'll uh, have a follow up on those questions uh, for everyone later that ask questions later. Enjoy your day. <laughs>